questions. 5 p.m. top of the hour. This is Slothcast, and this is your series uh, Drunk on Movies, where we pick a movie we like, find the booze that pairs well with it, drink the booze, and talk about the movie. I am your host, the Sloth Man, and with me, as always, is my co-host with the most, Trevor Beveridge. Trevor, how are you dealing with that Arizona heat today, 114 degrees? Arizona? Sorry. <laughs> Las Vegas? Um, it's actually hotter there. Um, yeah, uh, they say it might hit 116 today, which uh, it actually melted my phone briefly and stopped working. Whoa. Oof. Um, I, I think it singed my eyebrows just walking around outside. <laughs> it's brutal. Nothing to do but stay inside and watch movies. Well, we have a special guest today, actor, writer, director, podcaster, and tweeter. Let's face it, he's a modern-day Renaissance man, low-res, wonderbred, low. How are you? Oh, that's such a sweet introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I am a jack-of-all-trades. I'm doing great. I'm doing fantastic. You like my, my box in the background? I got this. this hold on. This is, a, this is a prop for uh, Mass State Lottery, but I just bought two of these real cheap on eBay. Mitsubishi. It's kind of like this. It's like Zoom point, uh, oh, like O2. Whoa. This is from 1988. So you can call people. You plug it in with a landline. And, uh, it, you know, your face comes up on the screen or their face comes up on the screen. There's a little camera here. And uh, for some reason, whenever I plug it in, uh, my girlfriend says, oh, do you hear that hum? And I don't hear any hum. But very quickly, I get an intense headache. And it Whoa. feels like... The scene from Scanners where, where his head's just starting to bubble up, getting ready to pop. So these are <laughs> probably like cancerous. I'm probably going to have a brain tumor as a result of using these. <laughs> That's fucking cool, though, man. I never even heard of anything like that. Yeah, me either. Yeah, I didn't I, know that existed. I, I, me either. I, I was watching uh, old e uh, Siskel and Ebert episodes, right? And it auto-played, uh, you know, like they, for whatever reason, they did a gift recommendation episode for 1988. And they popped these up, these Mitsubishi something technical name and um they were like uh, 1500 bucks a piece well i scored two of them for 60 bucks on ebay That's, wow they're nice yeah they're I, they're a cool little relic i can't wait to see it in the movie because uh, you do your you, your project uh mass state lottery which i had the honor of of participating in uh you know it looks really cool man it was at thirteen thousand views on youtube Oh, it's, I think it's up higher now because I, I posted that. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people have been joining my Instagram and YouTube over like just random clips from movies or uh, uh, my Patreon series After Dark. And I've been putting out these little like comedic uh, clips and then I'll put like a $5 ad behind them and then I'll get like 20 new followers. I've been doing that regularly. So there was a whole batch of people that followed me that had no clue about Mass State Lottery that have just checked it out for the first time. And we're like reposting it. And it was a snowball effect where now it's got like more views on Instagram, more views on YouTube. And I got more people checking it out, uh, interested in the movie, wondering when it's coming out. And uh, yeah, that's that's been that's been pretty neat. So we are picking up some filming uh, very soon with um, some of the stars because we had a pretty successful PayPal donation campaign mm -hmm. um, where we wound up raising, you know, that you can set goals of like 5,000, 10,000. I thought 10,000 was a safe bet. Realistically, I'm thinking we're going to get like $750 from this because <laughs> um, I've run Kickstarters in the past for projects, uh, not under my current name, but maybe under my legal name. <laughs> um, and they, you know, I had a 50% accuracy rate. I was able to fund a comic book and then I failed at funding uh, some pickup shoots for a project that has been thankfully dead for like eight years, nine years now, uh, because that would have been terrible. But this campaign, we wound up raising uh, 6,000 something in uh, in the PayPal campaign. And then after the fact, you know, people had FOMO and they, they were like, oh, can we just like send you money? Because uh, we missed out on the campaign, we wound up raising $7,000. So we're going to be able to fly people in. We're going to be able to get some nice props like the the Mitsubishi box over here and um, it should all be smooth sailing heading into December, which is when we want to have it picture locked and ready for festivals. Far out, man. Do you, you want Fabulous. to, um, yeah. Do you want to, uh, you want to plug, you want to plug some stuff at just right at the beginning, just so people know. 
Well, I mean, if you just like type in low res Wonder Bread and do your best with the, the, the spelling, you, you should be able to find something. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not too concerned about that at the moment anyway, but uh, maybe just like twitter.com slash low res W. That's probably the most cohesive way of navigating all that. You're a, you're a very good tweeter. I love oh, thank you. That doesn't reflect no, always. Yeah. I'm, I think I average like, uh, if, if I'm lucky, like 20 likes on a tweet. Yeah, I know, man. I mean, you know, the, the good ones get overlooked. You know, you got to wait till you're dead and they're going to look at your Twitter and go, man, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny, right? Because I, I, I've been expecting for a while now to get uh, clipped from these platforms. And I do have like a strike on YouTube over, hmm, what did I get? A, I think I made like a, I made a parody video of Call Me By Your Name in... <laughs> 2018 or 2019 <laughs> where it was like the vhs trailer for that and it just like portrayed it as like a very creepy predatory relationship um <laughs> and people had a problem with that and i got mass flat like a lot of my videos got mass flagged and it didn't result in any strikes but uh it got s many videos that were like targeting t not targeting but like taking the piss out of certain types of people um age restricted and hidden behind like oh you can't do this or you can't do that or well we found a nudity thing or wh whatever it might be um and i wound up i think getting my first strike over that video and they're supposed to expire after three months this one hasn't so if i get two more then i'm i'm clipped but it just goes to show like nobody you know you're fine as long as the wrong i mean the I mean, the absolute wrong, uh, wrong demographic of people aren't paying attention to you if you draw their attention, you're done. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know what's weird too is I don't see any of these people, like people who get clipped, I don't see them going to Vimeo. Vimeo is actually a pretty good service. It's expensive to, you know, cause they charge, but but I, I they, they get good quality video. And um, yeah, I mean, you could post anything on there. I've had my movie on there um, that we did fucking 10 years ago or whatever it was. And it's got like, uh, well, I guess I'm going to out myself. It's got like copyrighted music on it and everything and, and uh, doesn't get taken down or nothing. Yeah, they don't seem to have a problem with that. The only time I've ever, I've ever, ever had a problem with Vimeo mm. is, um, you know, we do the show Civic TV every other Tuesday night where we'll watch a movie and comment over it. And yeah. Twitch has been pretty good about that. We've watched things like Jingle All the Way 2 with Larry the Cable Guy, <laughs> like real pieces of shit. And like some recent pieces of shit too. Uh, never had a problem with Twitch. When I re-upload to YouTube, sometimes I'll, I'll face a problem like that. Like maybe the monetization will be kicked off or um, it just will be restricted worldwide. Uh, certainly with Jingle All the Way 2, that's not getting shown anywhere. But I put that on Vimeo and they were like, no, you can't, you can't upload this. That was the only time. Otherwise, I haven't had a single problem with them. But Vimeo's problem is it's difficult to create any sort of sense of community on there, which is why I don't think people use it as much, even though it is superior for uploading. Like you can upload an H.264 encoded video and it will look like a Blu-ray. You know, yeah. it'll look good. And uh, if you do that on YouTube, it's going to look like shit. It's going to look horrible. Mm. And even if you upload it on Amazon Prime or something like this, uh, you know, I was talking to um, the Kino Corner, who's a no. YouTuber, and he's got a movie coming out with uh, Jeremy London from, or Jason London, one of those twins. The, the, whoever, which, whoever's the less bad twin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> he's got a movie with him coming out called Wasted Hours. And he was trying to get some, some feedback on uh, Amazon Prime's uploading system. Because that's the go-to thing. That that that's the third alternative. It's a little complicated, but it's just as readily available as YouTube and Vimeo, and people can find it easily that way. Um, what is it such, again? What is it? Just Amazon Prime. Amazon oh. Prime oh, lets you okay. Okay. upload. Yeah. So, um, but the problem with that is, and I've uploaded. Uh, I was trying to get Comfort Systems, a sketch series we did, on there, and I got the first episode up. And I had all the other episodes ready to go with subtitles and this, like they have a qualification system before they want to put anything up. And I watched it on, so I'm at my, my parents' house for the week. And, uh, you know, they have Comcast boxes with Amazon Prime ready to go and the other apps. So you go to Amazon Prime, you type in comfort, you pull it up, you play it. And the audio is horrible. The audio feels like it's only coming out of one channel. It's like it sounds like you ran a denoise filter over it and makes it all watery sounding. I'm like, what the fuck happened here? Um, 
and the the video is atrocious too. So I don't even understand why Amazon can't figure that out. It seems like Vimeo has the market carved out in terms of offering some like good playback, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, all right. So, well, I was um, I did that intro because you uh, told me about Fiverr. So I was like, maybe I could use this as a clip, but I wrote all that shit like really early, like at 5 a.m. this morning. And I was like fucking hungover. Mm-hmm. So it's just all these misspellings. I'm trying to just read from it directly. But <laughs> I got to ask you about that off, uh, you know, another time about definitely how to do it. Because I, I looked up some prof- profiles on there because Trevor told me about Fiverr as well. And um, it's like intimidating, you know, it's like, hey, I do this voice all the time. You've heard me in many commercials. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, dude, it's looking, it's looking slick and shit. And I'm like, I, I got to give you the not five. Five is like the public one. I got to give you the one that corporations use, which I can't I don't want to talk about here because I'm not trying to. If yeah. anyone gets mad at me at any point, I don't want to lead them right to <laughs> make some good money, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, fi- people do make a killing on Fiverr, like you know, all sorts of people uh, recruiting voice actors for projects. And a lot of those guys have the work cut out for them. They do legitimate like advertising for companies like Toyota or whoever. Um, and you can usually get a pretty good cost on them. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, this evening we are, uh, today's movie is the 2014 film Inherent Vice directed by Paul Thomas Anderson and we're drinking G4 Tequila Blanco, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's truly delicious. I'm drinking <laughs> some right now. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Just ah, got some bite to it. Yes. Part of our prerequisite, we were talking about this last time, is like you got to get fucked up when you come on, but you don't have to get fucked up. That's a lot of pressure, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't want anybody dropping the N-word or anything like that. <laughs> Trevor already, well, you can, already sneaks a couple in. You, you can press the call at any point, and uh, then it just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it just goes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, we don't, we don't know what, what people have to do later. And, you know. Right. So, Trevor, why don't yeah. you tell us about, uh, about our tequila here, man? Wait, wait, wait. You know, before we do that, I just want to say... I'll give you, can I give you my, my, okay. So this tequila is very good. It goes down super smooth and easy. And the high that you get from it, the buzz is very, uh, it's very fucking cool. And you can just keep drinking it and drinking it. But, but fair warning, the hangover the next day is not in the head. It's in the stomach and it feels like somebody ripped it out, put it upside (laughs) down and put it back in. And, um, I was I was wrecked every time I drank this because it's so delicious, and uh, yeah, that's all I gotta say. Yeah, well, okay. So the inspiration for this pairing came from basically reevaluating what I thought of this film. Uh, the first time I watched it, I was like, "All right, I'm gonna get really high. I'm gonna smoke a lot of weed, and that's gonna enhance the experience." Not so, at least not for me. Uh, I was just confused the whole time. I, uh, I told you, I, I really think this is the central theme of the film is paranoia. Mm-hmm. And oh. that crept into my head. I almost felt like someone was like watching me watch it. It was a very uncomfortable feeling. <laughs> so instead of getting high this time, um, I wanted more of more of an upbeat feeling and the only spirit uh, with demonstrated uh, stimulant effects are agave based spirits, tequila and mezcal. And to me, the best version of that is a really clean, traditionally made additive free Blanco tequila. It's like pure uncut cocaine. <laughs> And, and, and this, to me, actually is more of a Coke movie than a weed movie. You, you, you kind of you want to be, you want to have that energy. And then, and then the, par- the paranoia feels like a little more, uh, a little more interactive. Mm. Like you're paranoid for the characters. The, the rambling makes more sense. And, uh, you know, it's... It's a, it, it, there's a lot going on in the movie and it's you know, slightly long, a little above like normal runtime, nothing crazy, but 
uh, I think when you have this tequila with it, it's something you, you, you can kind of keep going with. It's, it's very sippable, but it's also shootable for when you need that, when you need to catch up. So, so why does it fuck you up? Like it does, like, it's, it's a different type of drunk. What is it? Something, something to do with the, uh, the pina, the, uh, blue Weber agave, but uh, there's specific things about this tequila too. Um, this is made by a very revered traditional Highland distillery, um, Pandio. They make a few different products, G4, which is what we're enjoying, Terra Alta and uh, Pesote. All of their, te- the most unique thing about it is all their tequila is made with rainwater. Mm. Not just well water like other artisan tequilas. It's made with rainwater? Yeah, they collect rain oh, and they use that to to make the f- fermented mash of the agave. And that's unique. No one else does this that I'm aware of. And it, it made me think of this movie because one of the central like pivotal scenes is when uh, Shasta and Doc are in the rain together. They keep going back to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, the practice of using rainwater is somewhat radical. It, uh-huh. This is kind of considered something like a hippie tequila for for that. And they, they're completely traditional methods, as traditional as possible. It's roasted in a brick oven. It's Tahona Crush, which is un- unusual. If, for those that don't know, Tahona are those giant wheels that traditionally they were they were pulled by donkeys, like in an old grain mill. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so they take these giant stone mills and crush agave with them, and rather than using uh, industrial methods like a like the the the, the rollers that kind of look like wood chippers. So this this is like hip, hippie rainwater tequila, man, and it's got some mystic properties. Yeah, it's a good it's a good pairing for this movie. It makes the movie f- kind of funnier. It just I thought so. It. Yeah, it slaps. Yeah, it. it wasn't until um, I kind of I wait. Or we'll let you know. Um, let's. Is there anything else you want to say about the tequila? No, that's the gist of it. I, the only other thing I guess is I felt like the name. Was- Oh, two things. One, uh, there, there's a lot of drinking in the movie, but the only thing that's explicitly mentioned is the tequila zombie cocktail. When he, when, when they're out at that uh, seafood restaurant. Yeah, the fish shack. Yeah, you're gonna get want to get good and fucked up before this meal. So I felt like tequila was appropriate, and also the name G Four sounds like some kind of something that the Golden Fang would traffic in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, if um, you want to, you want to transition into the movie then? Yep. That, yep. Let's do it. I would say I, but this bottle though, I'll just say this bottle runs about $40 in New York. What is it? 35 where you are? No, same price. It's well worth it. It's well, it's well worth it. I would say though. Yeah. Just drink, um, drink with caution. I drink with like, um, Maybe have no, a you could say that about to Kate. Yeah, you could say that about to Kate. I would say, I would say, drink this with some beer, and and don't have so much of it. Um, it only takes about two glasses, and you'll be uh, you'll be right as rain. So oh, I like that. <laughs> Very cute. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll get it. My, it the, the Zoom always fucks with the volume of the mic, but hang on a second. Um, okay, so 2014 Inherent Vice. Um, Paul Thomas Anderson. He's a very uh, he's a very Gen X. Uh, come you know comes from the same um, class as uh, Tarantino and um, David Fincher. Uh, what should we start with? Do we start with the negative or do we start with the positive? I I almost feel like. Um, what do you think? What do you think, guys? Well, I, I actually I want to run this by you guys. Do you guys think that uh, Paul Thomas Anderson is the most consistent '90s director behind Tarantino as far as quality of work? Because I, I I mean I feel like David Fincher has films where he kind of falls off, yeah. whereas Paul Thomas Anderson seems to maintain a level of quality with each of his movies. And I think maybe the first one that I just really had a problem with was this one. 
And my feelings about this one have evolved through every viewing. I know you said the same uh, as well, Anthony, when we were just briefly DMing about it, setting up the show. Um, but it didn't really hit me, I think, until this most recent viewing, um, how funny this movie was and also just, um, <laughs> you know, the texture that he's able to create with this world and this time. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree. I, I made a break breakthrough too, but it's because I, I basically gave myself Stockholm syndrome. It, it was like that. I remember you made a tweet a long time ago about, um, and I love that we can, I can talk about this because it's a, it's a weird 21st century thing, but you made this tweet about stalker and, <laughs> And there was a tweet of like, like when you first see Stalker and then with like on your fifth viewing of Stalker, you're just laughing your ass off at everything. Cause <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was, uh, what was it? It was like De Niro and Taxi Driver asleep and then De Niro and Cape Fear laughing in the theater. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically what I did with myself with this movie is like I watched it four times in the last 24 hours and I watched it probably another five or six times within the past month just because it's a movie I always go back to and I, I'll just cycle through it. And uh, cause I'm a big fan of the book. And, um, but I got to the point where I'm like, <laughs> he said he did, he did. you know, and, and, and I, I, I started reading into a lot of stuff, but, but to your, to your point was um, Paul Thomas Anderson is a consistent, con consistent director to Tarantino. I would say yes, but to a fault. There was, there is something that I had. There's some, there's something that, I, we talked about this when we were filming about, I, I mentioned this about Tom, Paul Thomas Anderson is that he's got basically one theme in all of his movies um, is that it's about the family. So Hard Aid is like about the father. Boogie Nights is about, you know, finding your parents and so finding your family, even if it's not your real family and they're fucked up, but they still, they still accept you for who you are and invite you back. Right. Then you get to um, Magnolia. That's all about, daughters and fathers and sons and fathers you get to punch drunk love and punch drunk love is about uh, you know this guy is surrounded by his sisters and none of them are nurturing to him they're kind of brutal to him and so he's seeking out nurture and he finds that with uh the the female i forget the female lead uh but he finds out with her um and she sort of like helps him become a man right and then you get to uh there will be blood there will be blood is like the be, you know it's a good example of father son and when daniel plainview smacks the shit out of eli right he goes home and he smacks the shit out of his own father because to him it's like he respects daniel and he's doing to his father what his father figure daniel that you know daniel plainview did to him right so that's kind of cool now when you get to the master the master is a break from this theme it's a more of a fraternal duality type of situation right there are some fraternal aspects within it um but you know when he yells at when he yells at freddy to to you know don't don't uh, you remember he's like yelling at him he's kind of scolding him in front of people um, but, but it's mostly, you know, the book that he's writing, Lancaster Dodd, is called The Dual Saber. And the, the, um, the, so to me, that movie's about duality. It's about the, what men do in the face of trauma, which is like, you either get your shit together like Dodd and, you, you know, you can create a cult or whatever it is, but, or you, you embrace the sort of chaos that Freddie does and uh, you're just lost, you know? Um, okay, so now we get to Inherent Vice. This is a total break from um, from the uh, the rest of his movies. One of the reasons why is because he transcribed the book into a script. So this is the way that he created the movie. He basically trans he he literally not basically he he transcribed the entire book into a script form. So he had like a thousand page script that he said he used as like a doorstop. And then he was able to just pull things out that he could, that he could just use that are from the book. And that's kind of how he made this movie. It's like patchwork. And then you get to Phantom Thread and he's back on his, on his old shit, which is, uh, you know, it's uh, Daniel Day Lewis's character is, is, he's got a sister. She takes care of him, but she doesn't give him what he needs. And what he needs is to be nurtured and to feel helpless like a, like a child. And so his lover is, is playing this role as she's like poisoning him, but he kind of, he wants to feel that helplessness. 
so he wants to feel nurtured. So, so, so to, to me, he is consistent, but sometimes it's like he's too, um, he's too blatant. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things I felt about his work as compared to Tarantino is like, if you compare this movie in Heron Vice to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I can pick up a scene where Brad Pitt is driving down the street, going back home. And like every single sequence, you know, you got all these different, you're, you're seeing LA, you're seeing the different parts of LA. It's in his, and um, he's listening to different music. And I'm like, this scene sticks in your head. And to me, I try to think of scenes that stick in my head with, with Paul Thomas Anderson. What I, what I remember are shots. So he's got a very nice like composition. This is a beautiful picture. But in terms of making the camera into a character, I, you know, I, uh, I haven't really seen that from him. The one shot that he is his staple shot is he'll start with the establishing shot and then he'll just move in close up very slow. That's like in every movie. But, uh, yeah, those are my, that's my. That, that's actually an extremely good point that I don't think I considered before, which is that Paul Thomas Anderson, and this film might be the exception to that, uh, I think he fails at creating a vibe with his movies. And Tarantino's movies are almost entirely a vibe. I mean, there, there are plenty of things. You know, he's a, an extremely competent and capable director. And, you know, that's not to take away from Paul Thomas Anderson's abilities either, but... You're, you're absolutely correct. There aren't necessarily... I mean, maybe with the exception of, like, There Will Be Blood and a little bit of Boogie Nights, there aren't, like, hallmark scenes that, you know, stick in your mind forever. It's really mm -hmm. what you're saying here. It's the visuals. It's, you know, just, just things you pick up that are part of the formula of the movie. Yeah. Yeah, Trev, you can jump in whenever you want, man. If you want to, if you want to say something. Well, it's, yeah, as far as consistency, I, I probably would have said Alexander Payne until he made that last dog shit movie, Downsizing. Oh, but God, yeah, Downsizing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think I will say, yeah, P Paul Thomas Anderson after Tarantino, and and I, he he does. I think the criticism I would make, and why I prefer Tarantino's films, is is, is like you said the, the those memorable moments and i i i feel like Alex, uh paul thomas anderson has a tendency to leave stuff in that could have been cut out i feel i feel like some of his movies feel like i i don't think this is one of them but i feel like some of his movies feel like they run a little long and as far as vibes go, like the main problem I have with Inherent Vice is I feel like there's a huge missed opportunity as far as the soundtrack went. Yeah. Mm. And this is something Tarantino is an absolute expert in. Yeah. Yeah. When you when when I think about um, those directors that we all fucking love, you know, we don't even have to say their names. But, you know, he's, you know, I mean, that love, you know, we love that that the time that they existed in, which was like. Scorsese and Milius and and Spielberg and George Lucas and um, you know I mean it goes on and on and on. What they would do is help each other. You know when they mm -hmm. had a problem and say, "Can you can you write this scene for me? Can you help me with this editing? Can you help me? What do you think?" You know, and uh, I, I guess I guess they're two these guys, the new guys, or the or they're now they're getting older, but they're um they seem to be very like they 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 like each other i know that paul thomas anderson and quinn tarantino are like really tight they're really good friends but uh and i'm sure they did fucking blow together uh but uh but i don't think paul thomas anderson smokes weed and you gotta smoke fucking weed to make a movie a, a stoner movie i mean he said that this movie was supposed to be cheech and chong this is supposed to be a cheech and chong movie he says this and i saw him in this interview i, I went to the 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 north american um uh premiere and then I, we were invited to a uh, interview with him and the director at the time, which was Kent Jones. And um, he, he said one of his influences for this movie, he wanted to make a Zucker Brothers movie. And Zucker Brothers, they did Airplane, they did The Naked Gun, they did a Police Squad, he specifically named. And um, I don't see it in this. I don't see any gags in this. I know that Josh Brolin said that this set was like the most chaotic that he had ever been on. And so the only thing that I can think of from watching it, like how you're saying it's this cocaine kind of movie, 
It's yes. every performance is disjointed. No, nobody's in the same fucking movie. Nobody knows what they're doing. So right. when, and, and, and I think that's by design because Paul Thomas Anderson was going, I'm going to be a little more free with this. We're, we're going to be free. I got the script. The script is the book basically. And we're just going to patch it together and see what sticks. And you can tell there's, there's improv scenes in it. Um, um, and I think that that hurts it because to be a Zucker brothers movie, Cheech and Chong movie, those guys, those motherfuckers worked to get that comedy down. You watch a Zucker brothers movie and there's, it's packed full of gags. It's packed. It's not, it's not just a visual gag. It's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a dialogue, it's, um, delivery, it's timing. And I think that he relied too much on this, like, I'm just going to be funny, guys. It's all loose. It's all cool. Like, just do whatever you want. And you can see this reflected in the Sancho character, who I think Louis, he should have gotten Louis Guzman to do the Louis Guzman to do that role, because Louis Guzman is just a natural character actor. And, you know, you used to hire Benicio Del Toro to, like, that's what he would do. He would come with a character and it'd be this memorable little thing that you go, man, I want more of that. In this movie, he just he looks bloated, tired. He looks like um, he just kind of is getting the paycheck. And, uh, you know, we, the last movie that we did was The Big Lebowski. And in The Big Lebowski, one of the things you notice is like every little character that's introduced gets a memorable line. Like every single one has a memorable line. You remember that character. You remember how they're dressed. This movie, they don't do that at all. There's nobody's memorable. The only, I, I don't. I don't know. It's part of the confusion of the the the, the, the plot itself. It's just like, who yeah. are we following here? Like, what is the? Yeah, it's it's a big ensemble cast, but really the only characters that in the movie that feel like worth keeping, based on on the way it's made, are Doc and Bigfoot. And mm-hmm. and that's not the book. You can't make a movie just about them. But I feel I feel like those are the only realized characters. And the thing is, is that in the book, they never, there's never really any understanding between Doc and Bigfoot. There is at the very end. And just like in the movie where they figure out all this, they actually come to sort of a piece at that scene where he's exchanging the Coke. And, and the funny part about the book is that after this kind of breakdown of Bigfoot, and this reconciliation between the two guys, he leaves Doc with all the drugs. So that's like a scene in the book that you're like, that's fucking funny. Cause they just had this kind of heart to heart. And then he's like, I'm still fucking you over. You know what I mean? Like he's still setting him up a bit. And um, the, uh, the, w- okay. So the music, if you, if th- the music is so to me is so bad that it f- throws off the entire tone of the what the movie is like johnny greenwood sure he's a great composer but one of the central themes in this movie the heart of this movie is the coy harlingen character who is played by owen wilson he he is a jazz musician for a surf rock band so he's the heart through the whole movie and like you said it's like a missed opportunity because you could have had saxophone playing throughout the whole part of the whole uh yeah. you know the whole or more aesthetic. period music more surf music more surf music if you play i did this if you if you put the if you put the movie on mute and um if you're listening to this do this at least you could do is just fucking humor me <laughs> but <laughs> if if you if you do that right you 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 put the, mo- the movie on mute at the beginning when shasta is in the apartment and then he brings her out and he sees her off. You play the song Feel Flows by the Beach Boys, which was released in 1970 when the movie takes place. And when Doc releases his, when Doc releases his hand from the car, you play Feel Flows from the very beginning. It creates a totally different vibe for the movie. It's unreal what it does. It doesn't completely match up. It does. It's it's like a five minute song, a long song, which was the uh, which was Can song. I think is seven minutes, but so you can ride it out. When they get to the pizza scene, it matches up again, and then he's talking to. It's a trippy song, but what the song is conveying is 
one of Pynchon's things that he does in his books is he creates songs. He writes songs that don't exist. And the songs mm. always have this narrative connection to what's going on with the protagonist. And if you look at the lyrics of Feel Flows by the Beach Boys, you'll see that this, this matches up. And I was telling Trevor earlier, it's like the fucking, the, even the, the opening Inherent Vice uh, title matches with the beat. Um, and, you know, whatever. You could pick your own fucking song if you want to, but I'm just saying like Can, Can is a great band, but, and that, that released in 1970, and I get what he was co- trying to convey, which is that he's a hipster and he knows what mu- good music is or something. I, I, I was going to ask, do you think he fell victim to his own pretentious nature here by trying to steer away from, like, well-recognized hits from that time? Yeah, I think you're right. Yes. Man. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I, 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 feel, I feel like that that is his flaw in general. I, f- I think he's brilliant. And his films are always watchable and he's a great filmmaker, but I feel like sometimes he gets a little, uh, it feels academic. too caught up in that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It feels like he's very not by the book, you know? And I, 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 yeah. I think his best movies are the ones where he meets into the main, the mainstream a little more. Mm-hmm. So which ones? As I get older, I, I like punch drunk love more and more. Yeah. I always thought that was kind of a, like a, a like a simple kind of like him going on vacation or something compared yeah. to what he was doing before and what he did after. But I, I, I like how it, it to me, it feels like a sweet little European movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it flows. There's 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 no throwaway scenes. Uh, it, it's his funniest movie, I think. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. I, I, I like a lot about it, but I, I also like There Will Be Blood, which I think is a total masterpiece. Yeah, you know, I, I, my favorite is the master, mm-hmm. because it's, it's, he breaks from his normal shit, and it's about, it's about friends, it's about brothers, it's about like, you get to a point with people, and it's like, hey, I'm going this way, and if you're, I wish you could go this way with me, but we're on different paths in life, man. We got to call it, you know, that's how that movie ends: the slow boat to China, right? And uh, yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman, I think, delivered a great performance. You should have got a, I, whatever awards they give. They should have given him a reward for that just because um, it was his last great role. And to me, he's probably the best actor of his generation. And um, um, they play off each other uh, very, uh, very well. I have to say after. if you, OK, so. Let me get into it. The if you, I have a theory here, and I and mm-hmm. I think my theory is pretty sound. My theory is is that Shasta is an acid flashback. She's actually not real; she doesn't exist. And if you take it like that, and you watch the movie, and what what you know about Doc through the dialogue is that he is an unreliable narrator. Mm-hmm. Because every character that talks to him always mentions the fact that you're always stoned and you don't know what's going on. You do too much drugs. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, Doc is from the 60s. He is, he's got a hangover from the 60s. Part of that hangover is, you know, you know he did LSD. You know he's having flashbacks. And I think that Shasta is a flashback. And I can break it down. Uh, when she shows up, She's dressed. She's dressed up, right? And and the narrator, Sortilege, is her name, who's played by I forget her name, but she's um Joanna Newsom. Yeah, Joanna something, but she's married Newsom. to and- Newsom. There you go. She's married to Andy Sandberg. She's great. I didn't know that. She's, yeah, yeah. She's she's great. She's great in that role. But uh, yeah. she says that she doesn't look like how Doc remembers. What what? And then in the next scene after he sees her and they go to pizza and stuff, they're eating pizza. She, he says, he says, um, you know, I thought, I didn't think that I would ever see her like that. I thought I would see her on TV. So when she shows up, right, he's just chilling on the couch and he looks over and she's there. And he's like, he says, he says, um, you know, what he's seeing in Shasta is what he thinks that she would look like now. Her, her, his idea of what she would be like. She shows up again, but 
and and this is by sort of Lige, the narrator she says that he remembers her in the faded uh country joe t-shirt with the bikini on mm-hmm. okay so mm-hmm. later on when she shows back up that's what she's wearing she's wearing his idea his his past memory of her the next and then the and and, and that reflects that flashback that actual flashback of them trying to score dope and being in the the you know trapped in the rain and stuff <clears throat> the, <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> at the end when they're in the car together it's surrounded by fog and and she's with him right mm-hmm. but before i get to that the um when he fucks her on the couch it's like a violent it's a violent kind of fuck right he doggy st- you know he's just boo, 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 boo. and to me to me that's masturbating <laughs> I, was, I was just about to say that he's jerking off because that's how guys jerk off we don't you know we don't yeah. fucking, you know we're not playing it pretty we're like you know? yeah 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 off. there's no foreplay there's no foreplay he's jerking right. off the only thing okay so you can break this apart and go that's not fucking right whatever the fuck but look it right we know that doc had he's not a reliable narrator he's always fucking stone he talks to his aunt and he talks to his aunt about Mickey Wolfman. He gets it in his fucking head that Mickey Wolfman needs his help. But Mickey Wolfman hasn't gotten in touch with him. What he says is, Mickey Wolfman, the guy from those commercials, the guy who runs the, 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 that Bigfoot Bjornsson does the commercials for. So he's mm-hmm. seen Mickey Wolfman's name. Mm-hmm. So my theory is that he just... And this is it's kind of from the book too. It kind of rides with the book as well. It's like he gets this... He just gets this idea in his head that Mickey Wolfman needs his help because Mickey Wolfman only shows up for a very small part in it. And he's fucked up too. So if you view the movie like that, it, it changes the experience a bit. Like he's just this ex hippie on this acid flashback, kind of hallucinating they don't reflect this in the movie as they do in the book, but he's constantly smoking weed. He's always smoking pot. He's smoking cigarettes. He's smoking pot. He's smoking whatever the fuck. And they, they do blow in the, in the, in the dentist scene. But, but yeah, I think if, if you go with that, um, with that, while while you watch it next time, I think it, it kind of enhances it a little bit. I think it at least makes sense of, the confusing nature of it beyond it just being okay well this guy's fucked up all the time and doesn't know how to keep things in order Mm -hmm. and be Mm -hmm. a a decent private investigator um yeah i that hadn't occurred to me at any point so i don't know it kind of i feel like it does you know if if put into theory and then watch they probably would check out uh he does kind of just fumble into the correct circumstance time after time and it sometimes doesn't link up to you know but yeah i I could i could see that being the case yeah it's an interesting um it's an interesting little thing i picked up on just because i've been listening to the audiobook as well i i read the book but for this i was listening to the audiobook like i said i've watched this like seven fucking times so i'm like maybe it's stockholm syndrome maybe i'm just reading into it and seeing shit you know what i mean but (laughs) yeah but but uh, that could. It's that all could of a sudden, possibly. it's like uh, Room yeah. Two Three Seven or, or or whatever the fucking Shining documentary was, where people are just, oh yeah, no, this was actually uh, this is about the Native Americans getting uh, raped by whites or something on the land, and uh, this is about <laughs> uh, Mother Teresa's uh, you know period being missed one month or I don't know. People just yeah, you they you re, you re, yeah. but the thing is, is that I didn't start there. Where I started was what is the story about. Hmm. So I know what the book's about. I know what happens. I know, all, I know all this shit. But what is this about? And to me, what this movie is about is about lost love. It's about we all have that woman in our lives. We all have that one woman that was when we were young and maybe we weren't even with each other that long. I know I can think of one. Maybe we were, maybe we weren't with each other a few months. Maybe, you know, whatever it was. But whatever it was, it stuck with us. It still sticks with us to this day, to this day and, and, it, and, it, and it influences how we treat the people that we love today. And so to me, what the book is about is a couple of things, and then the movie as well. It's like, you know, 
and I say the book mostly be, uh, uh, predominantly because, like I said, he 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 just basically just took the book and just translated it, right? And he changed the dialogue, and he changed the dialogue in a shitty way because the dialogue in the book is much funnier. In case in point is a uh, Tariq, the Michael K. Williams character, the black guy, when he walks in and and and, and he's got that fro going on that he just made himself. He's got this Afro that he was trying to make in his house. Remember he's like, he ties the shirt into his hair. He comes up to Tariq and he's like, what's up my brother. And then Tariq shuts him down. And he goes, that's enough of that fucking brother shit. You know, it's just like a funny moment. Um, but what I think this is about is about lost love. And this movie takes place in 1970. This is after the summer of love. So it's about, the, the sort of failure of the hippie movement, the flower power shit, it's the hangover from that. And it's also the hangover from being in love with someone that you can never have. And you can't have them because whatever. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong goals, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and, and so it's about him reconciling that and then what he does is he sees koi harlingen and he sees his wife and the kid and he sees a situation that he can actually fix and that's why they're the heart of the movie because he makes the sacrifice or whatever the fuck you know he, he goes out of his way remember she says even sardalege says it like or maybe he says he says he makes it a point not to get involved with matrimonial affairs when he's on the dock and shit it's mentioned and so, but he gets involved with this one because he sees that this isn't just like a love that is just completely lost because we'll never meet. He sees a love that's actually really strong. It's just somebody got lost. And all he does is he's, he's able to point him back home. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, yeah, I, you know, it's like what, two, two, two hours and 20 minutes or something. It's like, you know, you really have to be um, a fucking psycho to watch this thing seven times and get <laughs> this kind of emotion from it, because it because it's not really it's not really fucking clear what's going yeah. on. Yeah, it's it's a, I mean it's a rich movie. That's what's good about it. That's what's good about a lot of uh, the more ambitious films. Is they're rich. You can rewatch them with different viewpoints, and, and I think that's a, a a fun thing to do. And that's why. That's why I think it's kind of like a Coke movie is because you, you can get lost in different ideas about what this really means or what that really means, or what's really going on. And, and, and the way what I landed on last time I saw it is paranoia, which was the zeitgeist in 1970. It, the cops it, think everyone's part of a Mansonite cult. The hippies think everyone's a cop trying to figure out what they're up to and if they're on drugs and to steal their drugs and arrest bust them for drugs uh no one trusts anyone and, and especially when you're involved in, in in a story that's about investigation which means that you have to consider everything uh it lends itself to that well, that well, sort of parent and, and and lost love as you said when you think about like your ex when you think about the one that got away that itself lends itself i think to paranoia i mean it's a central theme of pynchon's novels they're all about yes he, it's his constant recurrent theme is paranoia i think the inconsistency with this movie was due to the fact that he originally wanted to do vineland which is about a daughter and father. And the, the, the father was an ex hippie and he kind of gets lost and she has to go find him. So it would have been again, a return to his form, to his like, you know, what he, his oeuvre, if you will, what he usually does. But I think that this, um, okay, I'll do inherent vice and we'll just make it up and we'll make it fun and it'll be funny and it'll be a stoner comedy. And, um, um, yeah, I think I think I think really the music to me, once you mentioned it, Trevor, is the central issue because it does turn it into a Coke movie with the music. 
the music is like you're on you're just like freaked out the whole time you know also yeah. you know, everybody all, all if you notice like everyone's really aggressive in this movie except for yeah, yeah that's what i'm yeah like even like the scenes <laughs> that should be sexy you're like kind of like you're like what the like 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 when he, they're talking about the pussy eater special and stuff yeah, yeah you're like you know someone's about to get hit in the head which is exactly what happens it's not sexy it's scary yeah it's always yeah. scary yeah 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 Bigfoot Bjornsson is just fucking totally just like manic and fucking angry all the time. Just constantly and- on edge. The only other mellow character really is um, is Eric Roberts. Is uh, what's uh. his name? Wolfman, right? So yeah, and that's just because he's gone. Like he's mentally checked out. And mm-hmm. yeah, he's by the way, this is probably his last reasonably good performance. In a film. <laughs> um, yeah, totally. Uh, now, I actually. Well, no, it ain't reasonably good. But I, I watched, um, you know, you you recommended Night Moves to check out. Well, I didn't see Night Moves in time. <laughs> I saw Night Walk from this year with Eric Roberts and Mickey Rourke and uh, Oliver Stone's son, Sean Stone. Maybe we'll, we'll cover that for movies at some point. But uh, he's literally just like, it, he shows up in the last third of the movie and he's drunk and you can tell he's drunk and he's slurring his words and uh, he's hilarious. <laughs> he's fantastic. <laughs> Well, uh, you, you, but yeah, in, in this movie, he actually seems to give a shit. He's not reading off cue cards. And granted, it's only one scene, mm-hmm. but just having him there, I think, elevates the movie some. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, he, he's like one he's, of the most memorable scenes, too. I yeah, think. definitely. And he, he's fucked up. I mean, he, I seen him at the premiere party afterward. He was walking through the crowd. Um, and he walks like. I thought it was a joke. I was like, "What? who's this guy just doing this crazy walk? He walks, I think he's got like a fake hip or something, but his left hand is turned in and he walks like, like he walks like he's like really limping around. I mean, I, I can't describe it. He walks like, like one leg gets thrown out and he comes in. I mean, he's like fucking crippled. Like he needs a cane or something. I, I was, and, and I guess that was from his, the accident that he had that kind of sidelined his career. It was very sad because he's a he's a terrific actor and he does give a great performance in this. Um, yeah, I, it, I don't. Yeah. It's such a rich cast, which is is one of the frustrating things about this film. Is it's the it, uh, the cast is fantastic, but I feel like oh you you almost don't feel it. You almost, yeah. You know. I, as a matter of fact, I totally it totally slipped my mind that Benicio del Toro was in this movie uh, right. until you just mentioned it. And it seems like uh you know he he doesn't seem compelled to you know try and try and do something with his roles recently. Like the last the last movie he really seemed to give a shit about was that first Sicario. And even that he's pretty stripped down. You know, he's just playing regular Benicio, but he's a little more intense than usual. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I watched him in um, that new Soderbergh movie, No Sudden Move mm-hmm. or No Sudden Moves. And it's the same thing as here. It's just mm-hmm. like, all right, I'm collecting my paycheck. How much time we got left? Hour and a half. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, I'll just I'll ride this out and then kill me off and we'll call it a day. Yeah, dude, I was like, why the fuck is this guy? I'm like, you're a fucking movie star, man. Hire a trainer. Stop drinking so goddamn much. And, you know, you know, lose some fucking weight. And like, just like, get back in the game, man. Like, what? Wh- wh- why did? Why are you fucked up? You you were beautiful. He was the fucking like Latin Brad Pitt. That guy was beautiful. I, I any movie he was gonna be in, I'm like, I'm gonna go fucking see that movie, man, because that guy is a great actor. He's a great character actor. And I don't know. I guess they, just, you know, and I feel the same way with Paul Thomas Anderson with this movie, and I feel kind of that way with Phantom Thread. Is like, you know. He still had Anderson still has his touch, but I think he's fucking bored, man. I, I think he's just like painting by numbers at this point. He's just like, all right, I got a contract. I got to get this thing together. It's like this movie feels like thrown together. Feels like they didn't have enough time. He always uses Johnny Greenwood. So he's like, just do the music, please. Thanks a lot. And, yeah. um, and it just, it's like, you should give a shit. Like if you watch, Tar- again, you juxtapose this with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I think is the best to me personally, I think is we're, we're going to do this movie in a couple of weeks if you want to come back on because um, I love I love this fucking, I, I watched this movie, 
I'll watch Inherent Vice and then I'll just watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood too. But I think it's the best. I think it's the best movie of the 21st century because it puts a stamp on the 20th century. It's like you don't have you don't even have to do another movie about the 20th century. You can leave it behind with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But you can tell that he gives a shit about every single shot and every single scene, and he'll cut shit out that doesn't fucking work. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, and, and and to juxtapose that with this, it's like he just looks like he's tired, man. He's got nothing else to say. Well, I, I think that comes back to what I said before, which is that he handles it in a very academic way. So when it comes to things like costume design or maybe story or uh, performances or, or just where things can go creatively, I think he, you know, all these different facets of filmmaking are like uh, tubes, right? And you reach your max capacity once the tube is filled up. And he looks at it as like, all right, it's a linear thing. I have to fill it maybe like seven out of 10 or eight out of 10. And somebody like Tarantino, who's a, you know more of a high school dropout filmmaker, doesn't even acknowledge that there are tubes there. It's just like, all right, well, we're just gonna do whatever. We're gonna, we're gonna do something that feels true to this time or, or this character's backstory. He goes super in depth like with, with what you're saying. And it's less clinical. It's handled in a less clinical manner. And it's so it, it feels more like an open canvas as opposed to, you know, writing an essay in whatever particular format you need to pass a test or whatever. So that that that's how I um you know break these two movies down anyway, uh, Inherent Vice and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, I'd definitely be down to to do that that show. Um especially now that I'm like three quarters of the way into the, the novelization that he just put out, which has been terrific. I got the book right here. Oh, yeah. oh it's good. It, yeah. I've been enjoying it. Yeah. yeah I, I read uh, like eight pages. It's, it's good. It's, is a good, yeah, it's a good time. It's a good right. time. It, uh, yeah. We'll, 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 we'll do that in a couple of weeks. Once I get finished with the book, I'll, I'll let you know, Trevor, and then, and then I'll let you know, low res, and then we'll see if, um, and then we'll just, we'll, we'll do it again. Uh, we'll do it. Cause it's, it's a good way to kind of, but the, um, like what you were saying about, yeah, I think you're right. I think he's like totally clinical. Well, if I just fill it with like nice looking shots, if I just do get hire good actors, if I just do this thing, it'll just like make this thing work. Whereas it's, yeah. whereas Quentin Tarantino seems like he comes from organically, like what needs to kind of happen. It's, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I saw Paul Thomas Anderson, how he acts around people. Um, after the after the sort of the ceremony, the screening, you go you go to the um, to Tavern on the Green, which is uh, it's uh, Alice Tully Hall is where they do the premieres at, and then you walk from Alice Tully Hall a few blocks over to Tavern on the Green, which is in Central Park. And uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, I was standing behind him and his and his uh, wife or his baby mama and i don't know if they're married but uh, <laughs> but isn't it uh it's maya rudolph right? it's maya rudolph yeah. yeah she's in the movie yeah who's in the movie she's, she's in the movie and the song that plays la 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 that song that's her mother mm-hmm. yeah oh, yeah that's right her mother was a was a you know big hit in the 70s she what, what was the song uh from the 70s it's called la fleur I think which is the flower, hmm. and didn't she uh, do loving you? Yes, or that's the, that's, that's the one I'm thinking. Oh, that's the one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, the one in the movie is Lafleur, and yeah. uh, I thought that that was a nice sentimental thing. But this kid comes up to him as we're waiting, and I'm behind them, uh, you know, and uh, I'm behind them. Uh, he lights up a cigarette. This kid comes up to him and says, "My favorite movie is There Will Be Blood." And he just kind of like glances at this, just, just real quick, just like, thanks, man. And that was it. <laughs> and I can perfectly picture that too, having seen like tons yeah. of interviews with him. He seems like very yeah. low energy. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way he walked, he walked like he'd never been smacked in the face before. You know what I mean? You know, like he's like, <laughs> this guy's never, this guy's never had to fucking answer for any of his bullshit. And, mm. uh, and you know, yeah. you know, he he. Uh, was so, someone was saying to me like, "I wonder what happened to his childhood that made him so obsessed." After I, after I presented my argument, you know, my my sort of crit- not critique or analysis of his work, 
I wonder what makes him so obsessed with, he must've had a shitty childhood. I'm like, nah, man, I bet that kid grew up in a middle-class home and it was fucking great. And he has this idea in his head about like fathers and sons and the complex uh, thing, you know, and he's just sort of obsessed with that theme. It sounds like he had a good relationship with his parents, except I think, I think maybe he might've gotten divorced or something maybe, but it's like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, he started out, I mean, if you think about his early career, right? He was what? I think he might have been an intern for Kubrick. Uh, he had some kind of uh, uh, connection to Kubrick uh, working for him because uh, he was able to see the um, the Eyes Wide Shut set while it was in production. I think because he was working with Tom Cruise, but he had done something uh, along like grunt work on... Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not too uh, brushed up on the history there, but I've seen so much in terms of like uh, making Eyes Wide Shut and also Magnolia and Boogie Nights being made around the same time. And there was some kind of connection there. And that was his early career. So mm. I think with this movie, um, you can take what I said or you can throw it out. But I, but but when you watch it, I think this you just need to pay attention to Joaquin Phoenix. Because I always thought that he was miscast. I still kind of think that. I think Ryan Gosling is a little more like funny and and could have filled those things up. I, I remember originally, you know, because he's got like a cult status uh, PTA. He's got this like he's got like a blog dedicated to him called I think it's called uh, Blood and Blood and Cigarettes or Wine and Cigarettes or something. Um, but I remember I remember when the um, news broke that it, this was the next movie uh it was before they went into principal photography that robert johnny jr was going to be in the role and of course when you look at what the role is you're like yeah of course he wouldn't do that because it's about doing drugs and shit and he kind of stays away from all of that now but uh but the idea of like robert downey jr is that he fills the scene up he can fill it up with with his just his facial features and I think Ryan Gosling has that same kind of thing too, where he can kind of like, he makes things funny. Um, and in fact, like casting Ryan Gosling in dramatic roles is just totally miscast. Like he's so, when he screams and shit, he's got that high, he's, he's got, got that girly scream. scream. <laughs> yeah. It does not, I mean, it, look, it fits him, right? But we've yeah. been conditioned to like tough guy Ryan Gosling the past 10 years, where when that comes out, it's like, oh yeah, you're just kind of a, like a bitchy little Canadian guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but you know after getting getting over that um watching joaquin phoenix he really he really does a good job of being doc of being this like stoner he's kind of mumbling the whole time he's always got that confused look on his face he, and his delivery is very good i think he did a, a really great job with it i think he adds something to it that uh, is probably not as common with that type of role, with the, like the goofy stoner type role, where it's always, oh, it's a, a you know, lighthearted person. He's always joking and kidding around. Nothing matters to him. But Joaquin Phoenix has like a base level darkness to his personality that you yeah. don't often see integrated into that type of character role. And so I really enjoyed, um, you know, when I first watched this movie, I was probably like 24 years old. And, you know, I couldn't, you know, I was still viewing movies in a certain way, even even that like recently. Um, and on this go around, to accept it on the terms of like, all right, well, this is just Doc's ride, and you're gonna follow him throughout that. Ignore the fact that maybe this is gonna get confusing, which we already know, uh, and just take it for for what that is. It's this character's journey from point A to point D, E, F, etc. Um, it's thoroughly enjoyable. If you you view it in in that scope and just uh, carry the investment in that character and have no investment in the case whatsoever, you know, um, so in that way I think it does succeed as a film because a movie can only really be as good or as interesting as its protagonist. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah. He um, he really he really carries he really carries the movie. Um, I agree. The the the, the book. Um, the book isn't really as confusing. It did take me a while to read it, and I would re, -re uh, Thomas Pynchon's work. If you, any of you guys ever read it, I know Trevor, you've read a couple of his things, and I know that you, you know, you've got a master's, you got all this shit. You're a smart guy, okay? I'm not a smart guy like you, but but 
Uh, that being said, I try. So uh, I, I, I read this book. I read it twice. I read it once when I was in LA and I was super stoned. And I didn't get any of it. And then I read it again because I, I found out that the premiere was happening in a few months and I was going to go to it. I was going to go to, the, I wanted to. So, and I met Paul, I met uh, Joaquin Phoenix at the premiere of Her. And I told him, you know, hey, I, man, I heard that you're going to be in, 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 in Inherent Vice. And I fucking love that book. And I can't wait to see what you're going to do. You know, and I was like, did you read the book or anything? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but anyway, but. <laughs> <laughs> but the book was like it's not that confusing it really isn't especially yeah a lot of but you got to read a lot of people go ahead oh, sorry no, no, i was no. just gonna say a lot of people say it's the most accessible novel of pensions that and his first novel his first novel is very very much on the level yeah. um yeah. but have they adapted you, any of uh his other books to film they have not no I don't think so. Yeah, he's he's hard to adapt, man. Because like, what I was uh, what I'm saying is like, reading the book, I would have to like, I would have to take. Sometimes I'd have to go two pages back. Sometimes I'd have to take like eight minutes on one page because his work is super dense. It'll be like, okay, here's the scene, and now we're gonna go into a memory, and then we're gonna go into a memory of that memory. And we're going to follow that for 10 pages. And then we're going to go yeah. back to the main narrative. Yeah. And, it's like Joycean or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he is very postmodern. I mean, he fills it with, um, he was a, uh, he started out as a Thomas Pynchon, um, started out as a, um, he was going to Cornell for um, uh, engineering and physics. And he's really into astrology astrology like um they mention it in in the movie they mention the um in, in the book as well about like uranus being the sign of bad vibes or something like that you know he's always mentioning astrology he's 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 so he's very sort of like interested he's he's an interested guy um but uh what does what the golden fang is is very fucking simple. I mean, it's a, it's like a, it's like a multinational conglomerate and it's the first, it's like one of the first ones. So that, that's why it keeps getting brought up. It's just a multinational conglomerate and, 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 and it's, and it, it's in everything, you know, it's involved in everything. They even mentioned COINTELPRO while he's being interviewed by those FBI agents and stuff. So it's like, if you know the history of that time, then, then, and I, I also think like you have to read the book to even understand what the movie's about. There's no, I, I, that's why I watched it so many times because I was going, let me, let me just keep watching this to like get the point of this fucking thing. What is the point? Like, are they explaining things correctly? Are, are you know, a lot of them are mumbling, some of the audio's off a little bit. But like, what are they talking about? What are we getting at here? What is the plot of this story? And um, it, the, the plot of the, you know, it kind of remains elusive. But because the, the central narrative of like, we need to save Mickey Wolfman is not the actual central narrative. The central narrative is like saving, Qu well, the, the, the central narrative is about love lost and being hung over from the sixties with this, also this kind of love lost, this, this is societal or whatever it is, love lost. But the, the sort of B plot is that core Coy Harlingen character. And so because they don't play the fucking saxophone or the, the, there's, there's nothing alluding to Coy being saved and like having this, you know, so it gets lost. And it's this thing, you know, when I directed um, my web series, the third episode was one that Trevor did. Trevor wrote a short story. And I adapted a friend's uh, story called uh, The Body, which is on Vimeo. You can check it out. If you, wow, your, your you friend me. Stephen King? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was sort of loosely adapted from a, a Bukowski short story. And... Um, what I did there was I said, you know, this shit doesn't work. I got to change some of the stuff that my friend wrote to kind of fit the narrative. And when it came to Trevor's short story that he wrote, 
which is um what do we have we have uh what, 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 what it was called the wandering ear mm -hmm. uh, i wanted to be exact i wanted to just go i'm gonna make everything that you wrote i'm gonna make that real and that was a in, in a waves it was a mistake i did it out of respect for trevor but in, in, in a way so it's a mistake for doing an adaptation because with an adaptation, adaptation is very difficult. And I think that, yeah, you can transcribe the script completely and film that completely and just kind of piece it together and patchwork it. But that's not how film works. Film works with like, it's gotta be visual narrative. It's gotta be stuff that we see and it's gotta be specific to the sort of human nature or you feel it in your heart. You know, you have to have a focal narrative going on. You know what I mean? So like this movie, Inherent Vice, feels like this thing that was thrown together and there was no central narrative thought up of. I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, you got to do what Jodorowsky said, which is what? Rape the material. You got to go in there and you got to <laughs> rape the material. Uh, yeah. So you, yes. you, don't, you don't think that this is a, um, an appropriate adaptation of the book? I know that Thomas Pynchon loves the adaptation. And I, and I know that like when the author loves the adaptation, it's, it's not a good movie. It's not a good project. No, again, just your, go to your pal, Stephen King. If, yeah. if he likes the adaptation, it's probably shit. It's probably terrible. Yeah. Ex dude, exactly, yeah. man. Exactly. Because, because yeah. of course, you know, of, and I can see why Pynchon loves it. It's cryptic. It's, um, it's hard to follow. The difference is, and, and so is Pynchon's novels, but the difference is, and you know, he captures the paranoia, he captures, he captures some of the stuff, but like to, um, but that's, that's not enough. Like for a movie, people got to feel, you got to like understand what's going on. People just do. And you can add mystery in there. I'm not saying you can't add mystery. Does but, he add anything to this movie that isn't already in the book? Or was he really just that strict where he was, plucking uh scenes from that uh manuscript that he put together he was essentially doing exactly what you just said but rewriting dialogue hmm. and in a negative way like in a, in, a, in a detrimental way to where you're like this isn't even like this isn't even as yeah. funny as the, as the original writing the original like his dial uh, pension's dialogue is really funny his um, I, I and I don't know what what tied his hands behind his back or I think it was I think it was time constraints. I think it was like we got to push this thing out. It's got to be released. I know it, I know it premiered at Venice and then it went to New York Film Festival. But so I think it was like we have this release coming and we got to get it out to Venice. So let's just throw it together. I mean, when it, it, there's no such thing as a clean adaptation from one medium to another there uh if you're adapting a book to a film you have to make certain choices no matter how true and literal to the source material you're trying to be and and this is where problems can arise uh when for example you have to think about where you're going to set it it's not going to be the same setting as the book because you have to actually have a, you have to have a physical background to shoot uh you can use the exact same di dialogue even though that it's not what happens here and uh you still have to make sure that the characters you cast are the proper conduit for the dialogue and then there's the soundtrack and and and, and those are all, those are all, i think all all things that affect adaptation yeah you're, you're talking about mood yes and and setting the mood setting the theme and and there's no mood the mood is like no completely chaotic I, it's, just, it's, it's completely it, chaotic you forget that essentially this film takes place at the beach a lot of it like right. that's where sportello lives and 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 it doesn't feel like a beach movie ever. No, it doesn't. And the whole book is filled with like fake surfer music. It's filled with real surfer music. Um, I even played the beginning um, 
on mute uh, with um, Sam Cook uh, over at Mary's place. It's mm-hmm. a great track. It's a great sixties track or, you know, it's like, there are so many choices that he could have made that he never, that, that he didn't just bother doing. I don't know what, what that, what that was about, but, but yeah. I mean, it's a missed opportunity. I feel, I feel, I, I know that this movie has gained a cult status and I think that it, it can, it can in a way kind of, it deserves it, but. Yeah, I sure. Was, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Trevor. No, no. I was just going to say that the challenge of adapting pension somewhat successfully and I would say making a very interesting film with the with a, a core of great performances is an achievement and it's cult status is deserved and there's a probably a reason people keep watching it again and again is because there it is so rich yeah do you think that there was a, a filmmaker who might have been better tailored to handle this material, let's let's assume it's the same cast, uh, roughly the same script, same same everything else, but there's a different director. Do you think someone else could have done a more adequate job? Yes, I think I think. Um, well, of course, Gilliam. Tim- oh, interesting. Hmm. Gilliam. I can picture that. Yeah, Gilliam has made the best drug movie of all time. In fear and loathing, and uh, I, I, I think I trust him to ha- handle complicated source material. And I don't know if it's Gilliam in 2014, unfortunately, but like if this is a fantasy, you know, of of what, when, and stuff. Like I almost feel like the book would have had to be have been written earlier to get the prime Gilliam. Yeah, I think um, I uh, I I think that maybe uh, yeah you could you could you could even pick um, Robert Altman, who Paul Thomas Anderson kind of apes from a lot. Absolutely. Um, you need to have like you need to have this sense if you're going to live in this chaotic world. You need to have that that um, what was that recording strategy that he did where he would just like open recording. You just leave microphones on all over the place. And so you have all this mixed dialogue going on. So you have to kind of like you have to really choose to focus on who's talking, who's like providing the central narrative. You know, I think. I, I Yeah, I think. But of course, he couldn't have done it. But I think if all that needed to happen was his buddy Tarantino coming in and being like, I'm going to help you <laughs> make a stoner movie. We're going to make this a really funny stoner movie. And so I, I actually wanted to touch on something you had said earlier about how you look at the directors from the seventies and it seemed like there was a click because you had, uh, was it Zoetrope pictures with uh, Spielberg and Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola and that whole new Hollywood gang. We're all buddies. And you do kind of have that in the 90s with uh, Tarantino and Paul Thomas Anderson, Robert Rodriguez. And I, I've seen clips of, I think, uh, maybe it was Tarantino and Rodriguez showing off from Dust Till Dawn or Grindhouse or one of these movies to like another well-known, oh, to Kevin Smith, because I was watching the making of Clerks 2 during that time. <laughs> and Kevin Smith requested uh-huh. feedback on Clerks 2 from these two guys. So they were like, all right, we're going to do a trade, I guess. You can check out clips from Grindhouse, and then we'll, we'll take a look at your film and tell you what, what's working and what's not working. Um, you know, it does kind of seem like that's dead and gone in general. Not relating to this Paul Thomas Anderson situation, which I agree. I think if Tarantino or anybody really put some eyes on this and uh, offered some some feedback, even though I think you get to a certain level that Tarantino or Paul Thomas Anderson's at. And, you know, the feedback probably only goes so far. You know, you don't see mm-hmm. filmmakers clicking up anymore like that or being a cohesive unit and uh, aiding one another. It seems like everybody's very oddly individualist without having any of the distinct character- uh, characteristics of being an individualist. Yeah, I, I um, maybe isolationist is a better better phrasing of that. Yeah, I think I I think you're right. I think um, and I think that's that is a 
um, central theme in the Generation X filmmakers who are all getting in their 50s and now they're just kind of tired and they're alone. So like there is, there's a sense of like being proud to just work by yourself. And it's one thing about our generation of filmmakers is that nobody's made their stamp yet. There's no new Tarantino. There's no new um, Paul Thomas Anderson. There's no, no, or David Fincher. There's none of these auteurs. You are one of them. And you have that uh, a mindset of like sharing. And I think that where we're at now with these guys is we got to just wave goodbye. You know, Tarantino is going to, he's going to come out with his last movie. Paul Thomas Anderson is going to work until he's probably fucking dead. Cause you know, whatever, but, and Fincher is going to do whatever too. But like our generation, the millennial generation, the, the, um, geriatric millennials if you were if you will we have yet to make a stamp and i feel like we can make that stamp but it has to be sort of together and it has to be stripped down and it has to be about what is going on with us not what's going on with them and they were focused on what's going on in the past the things that I remember growing up as a child, the things that I miss. We don't have that nostalgia. Some of the things we do, like action figures and cartoons and things that we love, but what, 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 but what are we going, what is going on right now? What can, we, what can we do right now? And a lot of us are lost in terms of how, how to do it. And I think now is the time to bring that style back here's my script or here's my project. What do you think works and what do you think doesn't? And I'm not going to have an ego about it, but I'm going to, I'm going to just listen. And, and I respect this person because I respect them as to, to I, I respect them as much to share my work with them. And I'm going to, to, to um, open myself up to like, Hey, yeah, I need some help here because if we don't do that, you know, I mean, yeah, sure. You can go see Marvel you can go see the superhero cape shit, but that shit does not fucking speak to us. It speaks to, to the younger kids, it speaks to the Zoomers and shit. It doesn't speak to us. It doesn't talk about our struggle, about what we're going through with COVID, with all the shit, all the, all the fucking shit. Where are we left? What are we left with? I mean, I have to go and, and like beg for a fucking job back and, it, and, and uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, and those jobs are not like great jobs. You know what I mean? You're just like, I just need some fucking, you know, what do you call it? Like uh, uh, income, what do you call that? The, the, uh, the uh, what is it called? Standard income or basic, in- basic income. You know what I mean? I just, oh yeah, yeah. UBI, universal UBI. basic income. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, not even universal. I'm just saying like, I'm sorry. What was the minimum wage? Just for you. Minimum wage. <laughs> you don't want it to be universal. You just want it. Yeah, and we're and we're all stuck in minimum wage or gig jobs. You know, I think yeah. of um, I think of Jack, the perfume nationalist, and I think of of his story. His story is like eight mile or something. Because to me, in my opinion, Jack, the perfume nationalist, turned podcasting into an art. He really turned it into like, I listen to his podcast. I'll hear about a movie and I don't even think I'll, I I know, I know I I won't even fucking like the movie, but I got to go watch it after he talks about it because he talks so eloquently about it. And this podcast in in, in a sense is inspired by that, about the pairing. He pairs perfume with uh, movies. We pair booze with movies. It'll never be, but, but it can never be what he does because he's like this sort of Andy Warhol of podcasting where it's like, I'm going to, what he the way that he describes movies the way he describes art is so inspiring well i think i think what he did was i mean a lot of people were feeling like podcasts were tapped out right there was like a frequently running joke uh circa like 2016 to 2018 which is like oh a podcast you're gonna do a podcast like it seemed like they had reached their max capacity of um what you can really do with that or uh you know, what kind of function that can serve in the, the online culture uh, because you had Mark Marin 
perfect like the interview podcast and then you had joe rogan doing something totally different which was a little more free form and then um you know he kind of goes away he's not he didn't go away but he's not in the same cultural shaping position that he once was and then you take a look at something like perfume nationalist where uh it's everything you just said and it's not necessarily the, like the form is not different from anything you've heard before um, but it's the two personalities and the texture that is created with that podcast and how they dissect things. And, uh, you know, obviously them bringing their perspective to it and the, um, you know, I don't want to say strategic because that makes it, th it feel like uh, slimy or something. But the uh, strategic uh, brushing of shoulders with people like the Red Scare Girls that granted them legitimacy where all of a sudden they're getting talked about in what was it like Interview Magazine or something. You know, these, um, you know, hip publications that offer sign of status. So now, all, you know, it's called Perfume National. If, if you listen to those early episodes, they say some very risque things and have some people on that you probably shouldn't have on your show if you want to get featured in an interview magazine, but it doesn't seem to matter. You know, nobody's, I mean, yeah, there's a couple of hit pieces, but they're not even really the focus of the hit piece. So they're part of this big cultural conversation that's developing about this next wave of podcasts and where this medium is going. And to what you were saying before about, you know, the 90s filmmakers or, or, or what have you were focusing on the past. We need to kind of carve out our, our, cultural imprint you know you can take a look at any film from the 60s 70s 80s 90s and you know you're going to get a slice of the culture from that time clearly defined and then it starts to sterilize around the the tens you know then it starts to get a little too clean and a little too like it, there's no distinct way in which many of those films are dated necessarily and i think what the real struggle is here that is maybe starting to change with uh, you know, films like the first, the documentary TFW, no GF, and then Dasha's film, the scary of 61st, regardless of the quality of those movies. And there's certainly a number of problems with the latter. Um, but I think what, what's starting to happen is, you know, in the tens decade, what a lot of millennial filmmakers and, and late gen X filmmakers were doing is, uh, they were defining culture by corporatism and whatever was popular corporately. You know, so a lot, much of that is films, it's, you know, music, it's television. But I don't think that was the case in the 70s. And I don't think that was necessarily a case for a good portion of the 1980s or, or maybe even 90s, really. Um, and what those two films do is it identifies the culture that we're in right now, which is a heavily online conspiracy culture. And it brings that to feature filmmaking in a way that feels authentic and honest to this period right now and not like the criminal minds csi law and order version of ah he killed someone there's a pepe tattoo on his abdomen you know that's total bullshit and we've gotten that from older people who were just out of touch yeah <coughs> i'm talking to you know yeah absolutely everything everything that you just said 100 percent. and i i what, what i was saying is like what i was trying to get at is Jack's story, Jack, the perfume nationalist, right? He did this thing and, and, and he was on your show, uh, but he, you know, he does this thing and he's, he is this, he's kind of the subcultural icon. At the same time, he works at a hotel. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's crazy too, right? Cause you, the show is so successful and he's right. doing very well on Patreon, but he complains about his just regular job. He's just yeah, a dude. yeah. And, and 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 you are a hustler. You you you. you I mean, no, you're not a hustler. You hustle. You hustle more than I've ever seen any anybody fucking hustle. You, I, I look at you and I know what you do, and I'm like, I'm fucking tired just hearing about it. <laughs> and, and and it's like, it's like this is our struggle. Yeah, this is the struggle. The struggle is like. Why are all these fucking talented people, these people who are who should be next in line? Why our struggle is like these geniuses are stuck behind a fucking desk, working for fucking schmucks, and like their side gig is they're 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 like um, rabbit from fucking Eight Mile. <laughs> 
You know what I mean? Like you're like every day you go out there, man, and you do your thing and it's fucking golden and it's great and it's beautiful. And then I got to go to work, you know, and you peace out and you got to go, you know, and the fucking track starts, you know what I mean? Dun, 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 right, dun, right, dun, right. dun, you know, and, and for, and so, so to, you know, that is, that is what we should be seeing because that is where we're at. We're at, nobody's picking up the phone anymore nobody gives a shit i wanted to be an actor since i was fucking like eight years old i knew i wanted to be an actor i don't want to be an actor in these movies i don't want to do this work i don't even want to go to auditions i don't want to send out headshots i don't want to get and none of that shit because i don't want to be in this thing that you're talking about this this corporate culture i don't want to be in that because i always wanted to affect people I wanted to touch them like I was touched by films, by, by films growing up, by films as a young man, whether it's um, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest or it's, um, you know, or it's uh, Five Easy Pieces. This idea of confronting our, our parents, confronting ourselves, where, we're, you know, th this type of thing. And, th and this is a, this is a uh, specifically to American um, people and where we are after you know after Trump after COVID is we're completely destroyed we don't need to be because we all have a, the same shit going on you know um, a lot of that it has to do with the media saying that Trump was like Hitler or something and not understanding like what the allure was which was that like no, man, we're all in a place that's fucked right now. And at least this guy's got like a sense of humor and he actually has like a presence that's like, like, like compelling and, 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 and making us feel proud of who we are. And that's completely fucking lost. And now we're like isolated on these little islands making these things and like, and hiding, like you said, like we, 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 when we were talking about before, it's like, you're going to get fucking got, you know what I mean? Like someone's, someone's aiming to just take you fucking down, you know? And all of it is empty because it has nothing to do with progress, has nothing to do. Look, if you want to be a socialist and you want to give everybody paychecks, hey, I love the fucking COVID paychecks. Keep fucking sending the checks. You know what I mean? Like if you got a strategy and you want to fucking do it, fine, fucking do it. But that's not what we're in. We're in like, we're, we're in this, this one thing. <laughs> but... What? <laughs> this this no, is no, what no. happens when you drink too much G4. The <laughs> noise starts. I thought we were here to talk about the movie. What the fuck? Well, no, here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? I went on the low res podcast. We did JFK. We talked about JFK okay. for about 20 minutes. But with low res, yeah. ad, which I have gotten feedback on, what people <laughs> like is that what okay. Chris does is he goes, we, we go wherever. And that's what I love right. about your po movies, the podcast movies, because you'll, 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 you'll start a movie. This is the movie we're going to talk about for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we're going to go wherever the fucking conversation takes us. And I fucking love that. It's just like free form, just off the cuff talking, man. That's what I, that's what I, that's, you know, that I, I am a listener to your podcast. I listen to it all the time. I think it's a great podcast because of that, because of that, because that like, I don't know where it's going to go. You know what well, I mean? I, I think it at least does tie back a bit to, um, you know, we're talking about the portrayal of, of culture here, maybe some of the shortcomings of this movie and uh, maybe who could have done it better, like an Altman type, as opposed to, you know, if you tune into movies, we're going to be talking about you know, straw dogs, and then somehow Hans is going to rope it to Iron Man and Captain America <laughs> Marvel for fucking 45 minutes. I have to like drag him out of that. Like, yes, it's bad. It's all bad. Okay, but let's get back to this movie. Right, right, right. Right, <laughs> right, right. But I love that the, the atmosphere that you set, dude, you set this atmosphere on your podcast as like, we're, you know what? Let's just fucking go. Let's go. That's a very, that's a really cool mindset. That's, but that's your, also your mindset like in real life too. You're just, you're just, you are that guy that's like, hey man, this is how you do this shit, and we're gonna just go with it. And uh, you know, I don't know, I, it's, 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 it's fucking good, man. It's golden. I mean, I, th I, I do think that that keeping things relatively fluid, even if you have like, a, you know, a, a set structure to it or, or something that you're at least aiming for, 
is probably the way to like maximize what you're going to get out of any given thing at, at any time. So I, I mean, I, I try to handle that with like a, a lot of filmmaking. Obviously, we, we kind of did certain things on the fly when we were shooting your scene from Mass State Lottery. Where it's just like, is this going to work? Oh, damn, we got like six Mexican kids in the background just playing with Tonka trucks or, or whatever the hell they were doing. Some dude smoking and looking right into the like, Fuck, we got to figure out a new way to do this. Just like, you know, you got to improvise, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I was at Tarantino on, uh, was it Mark Marin? I listened to him on Mark because I listened, I, you know, Tarantino is going to be ta- talking. I'm going to want to listen to it because um, I, I just, res- I think he's the best filmmaker around right now. I just think he is. I, I, you know, yeah, you might have, people might have differences, but I don't know. I, 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 uh, I disagree. But uh, uh, so anyway, I listened to Mark Maron's podcast. And he talks about how like, they're no longer going to do the $95 million talking movie. Like we're not doing Once Upon a Time in Hollywood ever again. This is the last time you're ever going to see a $95 million movie about mostly it's just people talking. And, you know, going through their day and shit. And so when you talk about Robert Altman, I, I have the um, Nashville, uh, you know, criterion. And so it comes with all the interviews and stuff. And he said, you know, what, what was the difference between you and everybody else? Like, why do you keep making movies and some, movie, and some people crap out, right? Like Milius, you know, he spent $10 million on the big Wednesday. But you go to um, Robert Altman, he says, all of my movies, the budget is 1.5. That's where I set it. I always set my movie at 1.5. And we need to get back to that. We need to get back to this movie is, is going to be less than a million dollars. It's like the Dennis Hopper mindset. You know, he made, I think he made, um, I think he made Easy Writer for like 900,000 or something. It was less than a million. Yeah. But that's what we have to do. We got to scale back. Mm. No, nobody wants to scale back. Everybody wants. To, everybody wants to live on credit. You know, and I. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm well, this too. I think there's a temptation in this day era to think that if you throw money at a problem, especially in the media, like if you work in media interests, if you throw money at a problem, that'll solve it. It's like, oh, it just was underfunded. It's a great story, great concept. We just didn't get enough money to make it work. Yeah, And that's been an excuse for a long time. And it's not the right excuse. And I, I shared the same trailer with you, Trevor, that I did with Lowe, which was that mm-hmm. trailer, the, the new Christina Ricci movie. Oh, oh, God. oh yeah, that movie. Wait, yeah. do you know the budget of that? I mean, it's I would upward. love to know. It's high. It's high. Somebody bought that. Somebody was like, we're going to make this thing. It's going to go. And the, and I'm sure the guy, you know, is completely earnest, um, you know, but, but that trailer, aside from the terrible, I mean, it's just terrible, but I forget what it's called, mm-hmm. but uh, it came along with the Karen trailer, the movie Karen. Oh, You're seeing, and I was telling you, Trevor, like, I think there's going to be a return of the seventies, but it's going to be all woke bullshit. It's going to be all bad. Cause they're going to go, well, we can't afford to make this anymore. So we, we're only going to be able to fund you s- so much money and it's got to be about like a topical thing, you know, but that movie yeah, it feels, was, feels like, st- like state funded cinema or something, but it's yeah. weird. Yeah. Cause it's, it's not, it's private, but it's just, be, it's, it's become this over oh, this, this tidal wave where somehow private interests have conferred with a certain idea ideology that is acceptable and so we're seeing one message and uh the result is a total lack of uh innovation and creativity yeah you yeah yeah, that's you just nailed it completely with that yeah and being able to um being able to recognize talent yes being able to recognize like what is needed in the culture because the whole culture has turned to China or whatever the fuck. It's like, no, nah. like we are the, the thing that makes America cool is that we are American and we have our own shit going on. It's what makes once upon a time in Hollywood. So fucking cool because it's like, this is an American movie about American people. And you don't find this anywhere else in the world. It's about, it's about who we are, what we are, and not where we were at, but, you know, once upon a time in Hollywood is where we were, 
<clears throat> we need movies about where we are. I think so. Yeah. Like no, I'm Man on board. <laughs> like, what you say? What'd you say? <laughs> like Nomadland, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, because I, I always hate it. I hate it when foreigners make movies about what they think Americans are like. It's such bullshit, and nobody watches it. Who fucking watched? Did you watch Nomadland, Lo? No, I did not. I uh, I skipped that one, and uh, I have no interest in checking it. It feels it, you know. <sighs> It's shit. Who gives a fuck about Nomadland? Yeah, yeah. There's no reason to watch it. I mean, the fact that it won Best Picture, and given what it's about, right? Yeah. Uh, it wins Best Picture at the Academy Awards, which are uh, certainly corporately sponsored. Then you already know there's not going to be anything uh, that deviates from the party line that's going to be found in that movie. Uh, the Academy Awards are just uh, disintegrating in front of our very eyes. I have a friend <laughs> who works for one of these um, one of these uh, distributors who says that they're already talking about, well, maybe we could do the Academy Awards over Twitch. We don't want to do that. It's a classy mm. show. It's a big show. Twitch feels very cheap, but they're already having those conversations. And it's only a matter of time before that starts to get... We, I mean, look... I think the people that run the Academy do know better. And the Academy president has said uh, certainly some things before. You know, it's a black woman, but she's uh, said some things before that indicate they want to do talent and quality first. But that's mm -hmm. not what they're going to do. They're beholden to this, this corporate MasterCard evil machine, uh, and they're going to die. They're going to wind up dying as a result of that, along with... Uh, a lot of other things, unless the whole system of things shift, which they could. I mean, we're seeing that filmmaking's system has shifted a bit where you don't have to necessarily disclose the real download numbers or viewing numbers, right? You can just throw, you can throw mm -hmm. something out there and, uh, you know, their capital that will be available will remain at a certain level if the investors are like, oh, well, you know, 240 million people just downloaded Black Widow this week. Great. Okay, we'll we'll stick with this. We're gonna stick to the plan. Um, sounds sounds very easy to manipulate, but uh, I do feel like there has to be a crash point that must be arrived to soon. And by soon, I mean probably within the next ten yeah. years. But we'll see. We'll see if that happens. I think we're already there. I, you know, I don't think people are going back to the theaters. I don't think they're gonna get those numbers where they where they need them to be. I think the budgets are going to be trimmed out. I do believe that there are going to be really shitty Karen movies or whatever the fuck. Meme but, movies, yeah. Yeah, meme movies. But I, I think that it's going to be a hard road. And it's going to be, it's going to be um, left up to creators like you, creators like me. We're going to have to just do it with whatever budget we can fucking work with. And the crowd, you know, it's going to be a hustle. That's it. It's just going to be a fucking hustle and it's going to be a grift. You know, I was always thinking about uh, the Perfume Nationalist. He should produce stuff because he can get traction on people's projects and be able to like boost a project up and people will fucking fund it. You know, um, I, and I, and I think that that is where it's at, you know, uh, unless you're a girl like uh, Dasha, from Red Scare. Oh, you just like this pretty girl. This is a little tiny pretty girl, big feet. You can like, you know, make your <laughs> 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 you can you can make your movie, you know, but like, you know, uh, those are not, you know, in and 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 uh proud we are of her and good luck. But they don't like America and they don't understand it and they're always trying to get back to Belarus or wherever the fuck they're from. We need movies about America, America <laughs> experience and the fucking you know the millennial experience man. <laughs> <laughs> because if you don't fucking do it it's gonna fucking go you know and uh, we, haven't, we haven't made our staple and we haven't made our voice fucking hurt and that and that needs to happen it needs to happen for our culture for for our you know why because when um foreigners watch our movie when italians watch our movies they go Fuck yeah, I want to do something like that. We inspire. We still do. We still have the power to. But 
the people in charge don't fucking get it. And so we're going to have to go around them somehow to do it because they want to see what, what, what is the, what is the next voice? And everybody, you know, if you go online, it's very negative, right? Like it's always like this defeatist thing of like, we're, we're done. You know, America's over. It's all, you know, fuck that. It's not. Well, it's maybe that- you can win best, best foreign film at the China film awards. Yeah, exactly. I don't think so. Yeah. And I don't want to. I, want I would love to see the China with... Film Awards on NBC this fall. I, 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 want, I, want, I want nothing to do with Venice or Cannes or anything like that. I want our shit to be fucking singular. Like so, it used to be. Yeah. It used to be. I, I, I'm right there with you. Uh, and I agree. Well, here's, here's what I do disagree with. I think the people that work and run the industry, uh, you know, they they do get it they understand what what needs to happen to reverse course but it's a lot of what you were saying before where nobody wants to take a pay cut you want to get good actors you're gonna have to you know you're gonna have to pay some money you you know that you know you can't put that back in the box after you know somebody's getting paid there's there's none left right good actors left they're all in their 50s and they're all tired like Benicio del Toro, yeah, a new Soderbergh movie. I was Trying so fucking strategically bored. Strategically hide his gut under a nice yeah or something. I I, was so fucking, <laughs> I turned that movie off. That movie was so fucking boring. Like this is what you guys are coming out. Oh, uh, well, it wasn't good. I haven't seen it. No, it's it, fucking. I didn't like it. I don't know how would you. There's think there's it? like three. I mean, that could have been three different movies in one. He couldn't stick to uh-huh. one. Look, if the, if it was just a, uh, oh, we're holding the family hostage plot then I think that could have worked. Or if you, if you just focused on one of the three things, then it works. Otherwise, it's too convoluted. Uh, these characters aren't interesting enough to, to hold my attention for two and a half hours. And I just thought it was a big waste of time. But because of what, what, what's being said right now, where it's like, okay, well, you can't afford these particular aspects or to buy your way into a distributor uh, or a distribution deal, rather, uh, you know, it, it has to come back to people on the ground making shit for extremely cheap. Uh, yes. If it doesn't, then what you're saying is correct. And, and yeah, that's going to be the end for a while. We're going to bookmark American culture. Um, but, I mean, I think a lot of things need to remake themselves in terms of how the industry works and getting movies out to places and also... Um, I mean, a lot of the problem just comes back to payment processors and and the things like Mastercard, like having too much authority over what is put out onto platforms like Patreon or Amazon or any of these things, where if something is a little too touchy, then it's getting wiped, it's getting cleansed. So I think a whole new system has to be built from the ground up that has probably nothing to do with creative in order for that culture to be able to thrive and have... uh, the easiest access possible touching that that mainstream populace yeah yeah i i, I think that the um fuck i've like pulled a muscle in my stomach from doing this shit because the thing is about to die the um i think <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> i pulled a fucking muscle ow the uh yeah i think you're right i think i i think the whole thing not just with Hollywood, but with the, you know, the country itself needs to be kind of remade. We need a, a leader who's uh, going to change things, whatever that's going to be. It's, 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 it's what it is, but you, you, you need the, 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 um, the culture right now reflects the politics, which is a bunch of people talking shit, but not doing shit. And they're just going like, Hey, we need to just uh, keep making the money come in. You know, my kid mm-hmm. needs to go to school and it's like, yeah, we need, we need to have a ground up version, you know, uh, like a, uh, an, a new, uh, fine FDR, you need a new FDR, you need a new Lincoln, you need a new Washington, whoever it's going to be. It's got to be somebody who's got a plan right. and yeah. And someone's got a plan and someone who loves the country. Because we don't have people who love the country. We have people who just, you know, they, uh, it's not that they, 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 they don't love the country. They love the money that they get from it. Yes. And it's all being exported. And it's like, no, man, we, we need to have, um, 
Yeah, I know. I know, Trevor, like we started on Paul Thomas Anderson and, and Heron Feist and yeah, watch it. And maybe like, you know, I like I said, I, I kind of gave you a little bit of a guide to watching the movie. Good. You know, drink the tequila. It's amazing. You're going to get fucked up and it's going to be fun and watch the movie if if uh, if that uh, so suits you. But, but what I'm saying is <clears throat> something sort of deeper is like. Um, if if we don't do it then we will see rot we will see decay and we will see bullshit and it, it, it's uh we don't have to be like this what's that meme we don't have to live like this you know it's like uh we can you know yeah i think people yeah. just need to to give a shit i mean we're, that's really all it comes down to is they they don't give a shit enough um you can certainly will a brand new culture in place of this. And all it takes is not many people. Um, it just takes enough force and enough, uh, I think, strategic prowess. And Critical appeal. mass. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth it. It's worth it to, to be able to go, you know, we all watch these movies that are from the seventies and we love them. We love them because they're American stories. <laughs> we're not watching Fellini or anything like that. You know, it's like we're watching whether it's Altman or Coppola or whoever, who, uh, whoever the fuck it is. But, <clears throat> um, we got to get back to that. And I think, you know your movie Mass State Lottery is going to get back to that. Well, let's well don't don't make any claims just yet. Like, <laughs> that, that book hasn't been f finished uh, being written just yet. We'll we'll see. I would like to oh. think so. Yeah. I'm very optimistic, we'll, but we'll see. Let's we'll wait. Yeah. So it's your first feature, you know. You know. I'm pulling uh, for it. Yeah. Thank you. We all are. We all are. And what I'm saying is, like, even if of course it's not going to meet that because you're still coming from the place of like, this has got to snap. Right. But, but when you, when, once you get that done, once you come, once you get that fucking shit out, that, that, that jism out of your system and it finally gets released and it's out into the world, the next project, the next thing can be more intimate. Can, can it, 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 it will. You know, it, it, it'll, it'll just from the budget alone, it'll make you go, okay, how do we make this cheaper? How do we make it faster? How do we make it um, um, better? And, and the way you do that is through writing. And the only way to do that is like, write about, you know, what is prescient in our time. And what's prescient in our time is that we're, we're basically in the 60s, except we're in the sixties. That was the seventies, which is this, this like great recession and nobody knows what to do. And we're in these endless wars. We're in all this bullshit. And, um, you know, w you know, how do we, how do we cope with that? Huh? It, it's still, it's still inherent vice is still relevant in its way. It is. It is. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, you know, inherent vice is a hangover. It's a hangover from the '60s. It, it is the failure of the '60s. That's what that movie is <clears throat> about. It's the failure of yeah. love lost, of this dream. <clears throat> and for the '60s, it was a, hallu a hallucination. For us, it's real. Yeah. It's I got to work. You know, we are the grandchildren that they always talked about, about our grandchildren are going to have to pay for this, our grandchildren are going to pay for that, all that. We are them. We are the first generation of them. Right. And so, you know, we stand as a guide for the Zoomers mm -hmm. in that sense, in, in terms of like, you know, yeah, you're, you're just going to have to go and get a retail job, bro, because you know and and then find a way to create on the side because we've been left behind and we're the generation that they always talked about was going to pay for everything we're paying for it we don't get social security 
401k, none of that shit. We're fucked. We are absolutely fucked. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. We'll see. Going? you sounded so bummed out like oh okay all right i'll get back to my retail <laughs> job now <laughs> like, yeah yeah. Uh, no, yeah i no no i i i i i don't think that it's it's a bummer i think that it's just reality and you just deal with what you got to deal with you know and you go through it mm. that's what i'm talking about yeah. is that we don't see stories about that we don't see any more B Rabbit, you know what I mean? Going back to work after he fucking kills it in the freestyle match and be like, fucking, I'm peacing out right now. You know what I mean? Podcast the movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fucking, fucking, what up? What? <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> it fucking reaches people. Certain, certain ones do. This one less so because we're usually fucking hammered when we're doing it. But. <laughs> 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 yeah but 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 yeah you know. no like you said it could be that inspiring story it doesn't even have to be about a podcast I, I it's actually probably a good thing that this movie hasn't been made about that like uh rising star rags to riches social media uh genius because it'll probably be insufferable but it, it rest assured it's coming well, the first taste of that we got was a social network. Um, uh-huh. And uh, we've seen, like, glimpses of that that don't quite understand the online culture very well. Like, I know Gia Coppola has a movie out, and I the title is Lost on Me, but it stars Andrew Garfield. And oh, it yeah. features the likes of Logan Paul and Desmond is Amazing and all these uh, terrifying hallmarks of the Internet. And um, yes, I haven't seen that, can't speak to that, but my... my my in, you know initial impression when I watched the trailer was no thank you I don't I'm not interested in seeing this so I don't know I don't know if anybody's going to be able to nail that necessarily or rather how it nah, can be I, integrated. I I have a hundred percent confidence that it'll suck ass it'll be just so awful. But I, I don't know and if there's it, anything it'll... interesting about it because we I mean we you know just by existing and, and watching these like personalities online you can very easily get an idea of how they rose to fame and popularity you know and you see a lot of their misbehavior that they like to market online and package that as content or their inst- like you you know enough about these types of people to understand the trajectory and uh what their pathology might be and how they handle their fame online so i don't know if that would necessarily be interesting yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Well, I guess uh, we've gone almost two hours. Should we uh, sign off, guys? Final yeah. thoughts. Final uh, thoughts. I I quite like Inherent Vice right now. My next viewing, I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, I went from like just not liking the movie at all to... Uh, <laughs> maybe a little more passionately not liking the movie at all to uh, really enjoying it on this third go around. So we'll see. I don't know. Maybe that Stockholm syndrome you mentioned is setting in gradually. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, watch it multiple times, try to file, follow the dialogue, but really, you know, follow Joaquin Phoenix. He does a great performance in it and uh, drink uh, the G4 tequila. Cause it's fucking good. Yeah, I, I I agree with all that. It's different every time you watch it, which is an indicator of a movie worth rewatching. Uh, on the other hand, uh, th- we're talking about a movie with Martin Short where he isn't funny somehow. So, oh my god, we didn't even talk issues. about Martin Short at any point during this. We talked about Eric Roberts before Martin Short. Yeah, Go think ahead, about that. Think about that shit. Right? No, 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 like, no, 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 no. Lowe has a different opinion here. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say that he's oh. necessarily funny, but I found him very enjoyable in this little scene. It was like, oh, wow, yeah, Martin Short. I forgot about Martin Short. Everybody forgot about Martin right. Short. And How do you forget about Martin Short? <laughs> I know. Well, what they like to do now is, you know, every so often NBC will throw, like, just a washed-up star in their, like, something sure to be canceled. Like, right now it's Don Johnson on Keenan, the sitcom. Somehow 
You know, he's yes. part of Keenan's family. Um, but Martin Short will pop up in just random. I think he was on John Mulaney's show, maybe. And they like Martin. Uh-huh. It was called Mulaney, but they would always show Martin Short in the previews. Like, hey, rem- remember <laughs> Martin Short? And then there was a there was a variety. Like this seemed like fucking crazy. I don't know who how, who greenlit this or thought it was a good idea. They did a variety show for half a season, I think, and then it got canceled. With Martin Short and Maya Rudolph, I remember it was that. called Marty and Maya, and I was like, "This it's you know it's 2015, 2016. First of all, I get the idea. Oh, you want to do a variety show? It's going to be a thing that comes back to that, like how they ushered out what was it, the Gong Show with Mike Myers, like a totally dead format <laughs> of television as a novelty, but just the pairing yeah. also of Martin Short and Maya Rudolph, like." And not nah, like I, I can't get behind that. So I would like to see Martin Short in more films. I enjoyed him in Inherent Vice. I thought he was a memorable character, and uh, you know he elevated it. But yeah, I don't know. I like Martin Short. It was a great scene. Yeah, it was a great scene. Great scene. Yeah, probably the, probably he, the highlight he, of the in movie. a sense. He's he he's the central character in the story. He's the one who dies. He's the one who gets murdered. Black kind of unwraps the case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. To Martin Short. To Martin is, uh, Short. Short. Yes. <laughs> we end all this. We all we end all of this on Martin Short. Yes. I'm fine with that. Works for me. 